John Fitzgerald Kennedy, often referred to by his initials JFK and the nickname Jack, was an American politician who served as the 35th President of the United States from 1961 until his assassination near the end of his third year in office. Kennedy was the youngest person to assume the presidency by election. He was also the youngest president at the end of his tenure. Kennedy served at the height of the Cold War, and the majority of his work as president concerned relations with the Soviet Union and Cuba. A Democrat, he represented Massachusetts in both houses of the U.S. Congress prior to his presidency. Born into the prominent Kennedy family in Brookline, Massachusetts, Kennedy graduated from Harvard University in 1940 before joining the U.S. Naval Reserve the following year. During World War II, he commanded a series of PT boats in the Pacific Theater. Kennedy's survival of the sinking of PT-109 and rescue of his fellow sailors made him a war hero for which he earned the Navy and Marine Corps Medal, but left him with serious injuries. After a brief stint in journalism, Kennedy represented a working-class Boston district in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1947 to 1953. He was subsequently elected to the U.S. Senate and served as the junior senator for Massachusetts from 1953 to 1960. While in the Senate, Kennedy published his book, Profiles in Courage, which won a Pulitzer Prize. In the 1960 presidential election, he narrowly defeated Republican opponent Richard Nixon, who was the incumbent vice president. Kennedy's humor, charm, and youth in addition to his father's money and contacts were great assets in his campaign. Kennedy's campaign gained momentum after the first televised presidential debates in American history. He was the first Catholic elected president. Kennedy's administration included high tensions with communist states in the Cold War. As a result, he increased the number of American military advisors in South Vietnam. The Strategic Hamlet program began in Vietnam during his presidency. In April 1961, he authorized an attempt to overthrow the Cuban government of Fidel Castro in the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. In November 1961, he authorized the Operation Mongoose, also aimed at removing the communists from power in Cuba. He rejected Operation Northwoods in March 1962, but his administration continued to plan for an invasion of Cuba in the summer of 1962. The following October, U.S. spy planes discovered Soviet missile bases had been deployed in Cuba, the resulting period of tensions, termed the Cuban Missile Crisis, nearly resulted in the breakout of a global thermonuclear conflict. He also signed the first nuclear weapons treaty in October 1963. Kennedy presided over the establishment of the Peace Corps, Alliance for Progress with Latin America, and the continuation of the Apollo program with the goal of landing a man on the moon before 1970. He also supported the civil rights movement but was only somewhat successful in passing his new frontier domestic policies. On November 22, 1963, Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. His vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, assumed the presidency upon Kennedy's death. Lee Harvey Oswald, a former U.S. Marine, was arrested for the assassination, but he was shot and killed by Jack Ruby two days later. The FBI and the Warren Commission both concluded Oswald had acted alone. After Kennedy's death, Congress enacted many of his proposals, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Revenue Act of 1964. Despite his truncated presidency, Kennedy ranks highly in polls of U.S. presidents with historians and the general public. His personal life has also been the focus of considerable sustained interest following public revelations in the 1970s of his chronic health ailments and extramarital affairs. Kennedy is the most recent U.S. president to have died in office. Early Life and Education John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born outside Boston in Brookline, Massachusetts on May 29, 1917, 
at 83 Beale Street to Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., a businessman and politician, and Rose Kennedy, a philanthropist and socialite. His paternal grandfather P.J. Kennedy served as a Massachusetts state legislator. Kennedy's maternal grandfather and namesake John F. Fitzgerald served as a U.S. congressman and was elected to two terms as mayor of Boston. All four of his grandparents were children of Irish immigrants. Kennedy had an older brother, Joseph Jr., and seven younger siblings, Rosemary, Kathleen, Eunice, Patricia, Robert, Jean, and Edward. Kennedy lived in Brookline for the first ten years of his life. He attended the local St. Idan's Church, where he was baptized on June 19, 1917. He was educated through the fourth grade at the Edward Devotion School, the Noble and Greenoff Lower School, and the Dexter School, all located in the Boston area. His earliest memories involved accompanying his grandfather Fitzgerald on walking tours of historic sites in Boston and discussions at the family dinner table about politics, sparking his interest in history and public service. His father's business had kept him away from the family for long stretches of time, and his ventures were concentrated on Wall Street and Hollywood. In 1927, the Dexter School announced it would not reopen before October after an outbreak of polio in Massachusetts. In September, the family decided to move from Boston by private railway car to the Riverdale neighborhood of New York City. Several years later, his brother Robert told Look magazine that his father had left Boston because of signs that read, No Irish need apply. The family spent summers and early autumns at their home in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, a village on Cape Cod, where they enjoyed swimming, sailing, and touch football. Christmas and Easter holidays were spent at their winter retreat in Palm Beach, Florida. Young John attended the Riverdale Country School a private school for boys from 5th to 7th grade, and was a member of Boy Scout Troop 2 in Bronxville, New York. In September 1930, Kennedy, then 13 years old, was shipped off to the Canterbury School in New Milford, Connecticut, for 8th grade. In April 1931, he had an appendectomy, after which he withdrew from Canterbury and recuperated at home. In September 1931, Kennedy started attending Choate School, a prestigious preparatory boarding school in Wallingford, Connecticut. His older brother Joe Jr. was already at Choate for two years and was a football player and leading student. Jack spent his first years at Choate in his older brother's shadow and compensated with rebellious behavior that attracted a clique. Their most notorious stunt was exploding a toilet seat with a powerful firecracker. In the next chapel assembly, the strict headmaster, George St. John, brandished the toilet seat and spoke of certain muckers who would spit in R.C. Defiantly Kennedy took a cue and named his group the Muckers Club, which included roommate and lifelong friend Kirk Lemoyne Lem Billings. During his years at Choate, Kennedy was beset by health problems that culminated with his emergency hospitalization in 1934 at Yale New Haven Hospital, where doctors suspected leukemia. In June 1934, he was admitted to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, the ultimate diagnosis there was colitis. Kennedy graduated from Choate in June of the following year, finishing 64th in a class of 112 students. He had been the business manager of the school yearbook and was voted the most likely to succeed. In September 1935, Kennedy made his first trip abroad when he traveled to London with his parents and his sister Kathleen. He intended to study under Harold Lasky at the London School of Economics, as his older brother had done. Ill health forced his return to the United States in October of that year, when he enrolled late and attended Princeton University but had to leave after two months due to a gastrointestinal illness. He was then hospitalized for observation at Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston. He convalesced further at the family winter home in Palm Beach, 
then spent the spring of 1936 working as a ranch hand on the 40,000-acre J6 cattle ranch outside Benson, Arizona. It is reported that ranchman Jack Spiden worked both brothers, very hard. In September 1936, Kennedy enrolled at Harvard College, and his application essay stated, The reasons that I have for wishing to go to Harvard are several. I feel that Harvard can give me a better background and a better liberal education than any other university. I have always wanted to go there, as I have felt that it is not just another college, but is a university with something definite to offer. Then too, I would like to go to the same college as my father. To be a Harvard man is an enviable distinction, and one that I sincerely hope I shall attain. He produced that year's annual Freshman Smoker, called by a reviewer an elaborate entertainment, which included in its cast outstanding personalities of the radio, screen, and sports world. He tried out for the football, golf, and swimming teams and earned a spot on the varsity swimming team. Kennedy also sailed in the star class and won the 1936 Nantucket Sound Star Championship. In July 1937, Kennedy sailed to France taking his convertible and spent ten weeks driving through Europe with Billings. In June 1938, Kennedy sailed overseas with his father and older brother to work at the American Embassy in London, where his father was President Franklin D. Roosevelt's U.S. Ambassador to the Court of St. James's. In 1939, Kennedy toured Europe, the Soviet Union, the Balkans, and the Middle East in preparation for his Harvard Senior Honors thesis. He then went to Berlin, where the U.S. diplomatic representative gave him a secret message about war breaking out soon to pass on to his father, and to Czechoslovakia before returning to London on September 1st. 1939, the day that Germany invaded Poland to mark the beginning of World War II. Two days later, the family was in the House of Commons for speeches endorsing the United Kingdom's declaration of war on Germany. Kennedy was sent as his father's representative to help with arrangements for American survivors of SS Athenia before flying back to the U.S. from Foynes, Ireland, on his first transatlantic flight. While Kennedy was an upperclassman at Harvard, he began to take his studies more seriously and developed an interest in political philosophy. He made the dean's list in his junior year. In 1940 Kennedy completed his thesis, Appeasement in Munich, about British negotiations during the Munich Agreement. The thesis eventually became a bestseller under the title Why England Slept. In addition to addressing Britain's unwillingness to strengthen its military in the lead-up to World War II, the book also called for an Anglo-American alliance against the rising totalitarian powers. Kennedy became increasingly supportive of U.S. intervention in World War II, and his father's isolationist beliefs resulted in the latter's dismissal as ambassador to the United Kingdom. This created a split between the Kennedy and Roosevelt families. In 1940, Kennedy graduated cum laude from Harvard with a Bachelor of Arts in Government, concentrating on international affairs. That fall, he enrolled at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and audited classes there. In early 1941, Kennedy left and helped his father write a memoir of his time as an American ambassador. He then traveled throughout South America, his itinerary included Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. U.S. Naval Reserve Kennedy planned to attend Yale Law School after auditing courses on business law at Stanford, but cancelled when American entry into World War II seemed imminent. In 1940, Kennedy attempted to enter the Army's Officer Candidate School. Despite months of training, he was medically disqualified due to his chronic lower back problems. On September 24, 1941, Kennedy, with the help of the Director of the Office of Naval Intelligence and the former naval attaché to Joseph Kennedy, Alan Kirk, joined the United States Naval Reserve. He was commissioned an ensign on October 26, 1941, and joined the staff of the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington, D.C. In January 1942, 
Kennedy was assigned to the ONI field office at headquarters, 6th Naval District, in Charleston, South Carolina. He attended the Naval Reserve Officer Training School at Northwestern University in Chicago from July 27 to September 27 and then voluntarily entered the Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron's Training Center in Melville, Rhode Island. On October 10, he was promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade. In early November, Kennedy was still mourning the death of his close, childhood friend, Marine Corps Second Lieutenant George Hauk Meade Jr., who had been killed in action at Guadalcanal that August and awarded the Navy Cross for his bravery. Accompanied by a female acquaintance from a wealthy Newport family, the couple had stopped in Middletown, Rhode Island at the cemetery where the decorated, naval spy, Commander Hugo W. Kohler, USN, had been buried the previous year. Ambling around the plots near the tiny St. Columbus Chapel, Kennedy paused over Kohler's white granite cross grave marker and pondered his own mortality, hoping out loud that when his time came, he would not have to die without religion. But these things can't be faked, he added. There's no bluffing. Two decades later, Kennedy and Kohler's stepson, U.S. Senator Claiborne Pell had become good friends and political allies although they had been acquaintances since the mid-1930s during their salad days on the same Newport debutante party circuit and when Pell had dated Kathleen Kennedy. Kennedy completed his training on December 2 and was assigned to Motor Torpedo Squadron 4. His first command was PT-101 from December 7, 1942, until February 23, 1943. It was a patrol torpedo boat used for training while Kennedy was an instructor at Melville. He then led three Huckins PT boats PT-98, PT-99 and PT-101, which were being relocated from Bryn 4 in Melville, Rhode Island, back to Jacksonville, Florida and the new Bryn 14. During the trip south, he was hospitalized briefly in Jacksonville after diving into the cold water to unfoul a propeller. Thereafter, Kennedy was assigned duty in Panama and later in the Pacific Theater, where he eventually commanded two more PT boats. Commanding IPT 109-I None Commanding IPT 59-I None Military Awards In addition to the various campaign medals received for his war service, Kennedy was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal for his conduct during and after the loss of PT-109, as well as the Purple Heart for being wounded. Navy and Marine Corps Medal Citation Journalism In April 1945, Kennedy's father, who was a friend of William Randolph Hearst, arranged a position for his son as a special correspondent for Hearst Newspapers, the assignment kept Kennedy's name in the public eye and exposed him to journalism as a possible career. He worked as a correspondent that May and went to Berlin for a second time, covering the Potsdam Conference and other events. Congressional Career JFK's elder brother Joe had been the family's political standard bearer and had been tapped by their father to seek the presidency. Joe's death during the war in 1944 changed that course and the assignment fell to JFK as the second eldest of the Kennedy siblings. House of Representatives At the urging of Kennedy's father, U.S. Representative James Michael Curley vacated his seat in the strongly Democratic 11th Congressional District of Massachusetts to become mayor of Boston in 1946. Kennedy established his residency at an apartment building on 122 Bowdoin Street across from the Massachusetts State House. With his father financing and running his campaign under the slogan The New Generation Offers a Leader, Kennedy won the Democratic primary with 42% of the vote, defeating 10 other candidates. His father joked after the campaign, With the money I spent, I could have elected my chauffeur. Campaigning around Boston, Kennedy called for better housing for veterans, better health care for all, and support for organized labor's campaign for reasonable work hours, a healthy workplace, and the right to organize, bargain, and strike. In addition, 
he campaigned for peace through the United Nations and strong opposition to the Soviet Union. Though Republicans took control of the House in the 1946 elections, Kennedy defeated his Republican opponent in the general election, taking 73 percent of the vote. Along with Richard Nixon and Joseph McCarthy, Kennedy was one of several World War II veterans elected to Congress that year. Kennedy served in the House for six years, joining the Influential Education and Labor Committee and the Veterans Affairs Committee. He concentrated his attention on international affairs, supporting the Truman Doctrine as the appropriate response to the emerging Cold War. He also supported public housing and opposed the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, which restricted the power of labor unions. Though not as vocal an anti-communist as McCarthy, Kennedy supported the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which required communists to register with the government, and he deplored the loss of China. Having served as a Boy Scout during his childhood, Kennedy was active in the Boston Council from 1946 to 1955 as district vice chairman, member of the executive board, vice president, and national council representative. Almost every weekend that Congress was in session, Kennedy would fly back to Massachusetts to give speeches to veteran, fraternal, and civic groups, while maintaining an index card file on individuals who might be helpful for a future campaign for statewide office. JFK set a goal of speaking in every city and town in Massachusetts prior to 1952. Senate As early as 1949, Kennedy began preparing to run for the Senate in 1952 against Republican three-term incumbent Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. with the campaign slogan Kennedy will do more for Massachusetts. Joseph Kennedy again financed his son's candidacy, while John Kennedy's younger brother Robert F. Kennedy emerged as an important member of the campaign as manager. The campaign hosted a series of teas at hotels and parlors across Massachusetts to reach out to women voters. In the presidential election, Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower carried Massachusetts by a margin of 208,000 votes, but Kennedy defeated Lodge by 70,000 votes for the Senate seat. The following year, he married Jacqueline Bouvier. Kennedy underwent several spinal operations over the next two years. Often absent from the Senate, he was at times critically ill and received Catholic last rites. During his convalescence in 1956, he published Profiles in Courage, a book about U.S. senators who risked their careers for their personal beliefs, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 1957. Rumors that this work was CO written by his close advisor and speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, were confirmed in Sorensen's 2008 autobiography. At the start of his first term, Kennedy focused on Massachusetts-specific issues by sponsoring bills to help the fishing, textile manufacturing, and watchmaking industries. In 1954, Senator Kennedy voted in favor of the St. Lawrence Seaway which would connect the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean, despite opposition from Massachusetts politicians who argued that the project would cripple New England's shipping industry, including the Port of Boston. Three years later, Kennedy chaired a special committee to select the five greatest U.S. senators in history so their portraits could decorate the Senate reception room. That same year, Kennedy joined the Senate Labor Rackets Committee with his brother Robert to investigate crime infiltration of labor unions. In 1958, Kennedy introduced a bill which became the first major labor relations bill to pass either house since the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947. The bill dealt largely with the control of union abuses exposed by the McClellan Committee but did not incorporate tough Taft-Hartley amendments requested by President Eisenhower. It survived Senate floor attempts to include Taft-Hartley amendments and gained passage but was rejected by the House. At the 1956 Democratic National Convention, Kennedy gave the nominating speech for the party's presidential nominee, Adlai Stevenson II. Stevenson let the convention select the vice presidential nominee. Kennedy finished second in the balloting, 
losing to Senator Estes Key Favre of Tennessee but receiving national exposure as a result. A matter demanding Kennedy's attention in the Senate was President Eisenhower's bill for the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Kennedy cast a procedural vote against it and this was considered by some to be an appeasement of Southern Democratic opponents of the bill. Kennedy did vote for Title III of the Act, which would have given the Attorney General powers to enjoin, but Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson agreed to let the provision die as a compromise measure. Kennedy also voted for Title IV, termed the Jury Trial Amendment. Many civil rights advocates at the time criticized that vote as one which would weaken the act. A final compromise bill, which Kennedy supported, was passed in September 1957. He proposed on July 2, 1957, that the U.S. support Algeria's effort to gain independence from France. The following year, Kennedy authored A Nation of Immigrants which analyzed the importance of immigration in the country's history as well as proposals to reevaluate immigration law. In 1958, Kennedy was re-elected to a second term in the Senate, defeating Republican opponent, Boston lawyer Vincent J. Celeste, by a margin of 874,608 votes, the largest margin in the history of Massachusetts politics. It was during his re-election campaign that Kennedy's press secretary at the time, Robert E. Thompson, put together a film entitled The U.S. Senator John F. Kennedy Story, which exhibited a day in the life of the senator and showcased his family life as well as the inner workings of his office to solve Massachusetts-related issues. It was the most comprehensive film produced about Kennedy up to that time. In the aftermath of his re-election, Kennedy began preparing to run for president by traveling throughout the U.S. with the aim of building his candidacy for 1960. When it came to conservation, Kennedy, a Massachusetts Audubon Society supporter, wanted to make sure that the shorelines of Cape Cod remained unsullied by future industrialization. On September 3, 1959, Kennedy co-sponsored the Cape Cod National Seashore Bill with his Republican colleague Senator Leverett Saltonstall. Kennedy's father was a strong supporter and friend of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Additionally, Bobby Kennedy worked for McCarthy's subcommittee, and McCarthy dated Kennedy's sister Patricia. Kennedy told historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., Hell, half my voters in Massachusetts look on McCarthy as a hero. In 1954, the Senate voted to censure McCarthy, and Kennedy drafted a speech supporting the censure. However, it was not delivered because Kennedy was hospitalized at the time. The speech put Kennedy in the apparent position of participating by pairing his vote against that of another senator and opposing the censure. Although Kennedy never indicated how he would have voted, the episode damaged his support among members of the liberal community including Eleanor Roosevelt, in the 1956 and 1960 elections. 1960 Presidential Election On December 17, 1959, a letter from Kennedy's staff which was to be sent to active and influential Democrats was leaked stating that he would announce his presidential campaign on January 2, 1960. On January 2, 1960, Kennedy announced his candidacy for the Democratic presidential nomination. Though some questioned Kennedy's age and experience, his charisma and eloquence earned him numerous supporters. Many Americans held anti-Catholic attitudes, but Kennedy's vocal support of the separation of church and state helped defuse the situation. His religion also helped him win a devoted following among many Catholic voters. Kennedy faced several potential challengers for the Democratic nomination, including Senate Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson, Adlai Stevenson II, and Senator Hubert Humphrey. Kennedy's presidential campaign was a family affair, funded by his father and with his younger brother Robert, acting as his campaign manager. John preferred Ivy League policy advisors, but unlike his father, he enjoyed the give and take of Massachusetts politics and built a largely Irish team of campaigners, headed by Larry O'Brien and Kenneth O'Donnell. 
Kennedy traveled extensively to build his support among Democratic elites and voters. At the time, party officials controlled most of the delegates, but several states also held primaries, and Kennedy sought to win several primaries to boost his chances of winning the nomination. In his first major test, Kennedy won the Wisconsin primary, effectively ending Humphrey's hopes of winning the presidency. Nonetheless, Kennedy and Humphrey faced each other in a competitive West Virginia primary in which Kennedy could not benefit from a Catholic bloc, as he had in Wisconsin. Kennedy won the West Virginia primary, impressing many in the party, but at the start of the 1960 Democratic National Convention, it was unclear as to whether he would win the nomination. When Kennedy entered the convention, he had the most delegates, but not enough to ensure that he would win the nomination. Stevenson the 1952 and 1956 presidential nominee remained very popular in the party, while Johnson also hoped to win the nomination with the support from party leaders. Kennedy's candidacy also faced opposition from former President Harry S. Truman, who was concerned about Kennedy's lack of experience. Kennedy knew that a second ballot could give the nomination to Johnson or someone else, and his well-organized campaign was able to earn the support of just enough delegates to win the presidential nomination on the first ballot. Kennedy ignored the opposition of his brother, who wanted him to choose labor leader Walter Ruther, and other liberal supporters when he chose Johnson as his vice presidential nominee. He believed that the Texas senator could help him win support from the South. The choice infuriated many in labor. AFL-CIO President George Meany called Johnson the arch-foe of labor, while Illinois AFL-CIO President Reuben Soderstrom asserted Kennedy had made chumps out of leaders of the American labor movement. In accepting the presidential nomination, Kennedy gave his well-known New Frontier speech, saying, for the problems are not all solved and the battles are not all won and we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. But the new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises it is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. At the start of the fall general election campaign, the Republican nominee and incumbent Vice President Richard Nixon held a six-point lead in the polls. Major issues included how to get the economy moving again, Kennedy's Roman Catholicism, the Cuban Revolution, and whether the space and missile programs of the Soviet Union had surpassed those of the U.S. To address fears that his being Catholic would impact his decision-making, he told the Greater Houston Ministerial Association on September 12, 1960, I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party candidate for president who also happens to be a Catholic. I do not speak for my church on public matters and the church does not speak for me. Kennedy questioned rhetorically whether one quarter of Americans were relegated to second-class citizenship just because they were Catholic, and once stated that O oh, one asked me my religion in the South Pacific. Despite Kennedy's efforts to quell anti-Catholic concerns and similar statements by high-profile Protestant figures, religious bigotry would dog the Democratic candidate through the end of the campaign. His score among white Protestants would ultimately be lower than Adlai Stevenson's in 1956, though Stevenson lost his election. Some Catholic leaders also expressed reservations about Kennedy, but the vast majority of lay people rallied to him. Nixon attended the first of these debates after a day of campaigning, whilst running a fever and having previously suffered an infected leg injury earlier in the campaign. During the debate Nixon looked at the reporters asking questions and not at the camera, and was perspirating which his makeup accentuated. He wore a tan suit which reduced his presence against the set background and his fast-growing facial hair was visible as five o'clock shadow. In contrast, Kennedy had spent the preceding days on debate preparation, appeared relaxed and looked into the camera whilst answering questions. It is commonly said that Kennedy appearing to be the more attractive man of the two won him the debate, 
largely because of a poll in which voters who watched on TV thought that Kennedy had won but radio listeners believed Nixon to have won. However, only one poll split TV and radio voters like this and the methodology of the pollsters was poor failing to account for pre-debate political or religious biases and only interviewing 178 radio listeners who believed the debate had been won by either candidate. The location of the polling is also unknown, even though Nixon would have been more popular pre-debate anyway in Protestant, rural areas with less access to television. 1960 was a close race and there is no polling available consistent with the idea that Nixon lost or Kennedy gained support as a result of the debate. Vansell and Pendle point out that Nixon did not win the debate by strength of argument either, Democratic figures were satisfied with Kennedy's debate performance and even many Southern Democrats who had been apathetic or hostile towards Kennedy were impressed but Nixon's performance alarmed Republican figures who thought that his defensiveness and me-tooism realized their worst fears and was a surprisingly poor performance from him. The debates are now considered a milestone in American political history the point at which the medium of television began to play a dominant role in politics. Kennedy's campaign gained momentum after the first debate, and he pulled slightly ahead of Nixon in most polls. On Election Day Kennedy defeated Nixon in one of the closest presidential elections of the 20th century. In the national popular vote, by most accounts, Kennedy led Nixon by just two-tenths of one percent, while in the Electoral College, he won 303 votes to Nixon's 219. Fourteen electors from Mississippi and Alabama refused to support Kennedy because of his support for the civil rights movement they voted for Senator Harry F. Byrd of Virginia, as did an elector from Oklahoma. Forty-three years old, Kennedy was the youngest person ever elected to the presidency. Presidency John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th president at noon on January 20, 1961. In his inaugural address, he spoke of the need for all Americans to be active citizens, Ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country. He asked the nations of the world to join to fight what he called the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. He added. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days. Nor will it be finished in the first 1000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. In closing, he expanded on his desire for greater internationalism, finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. The address reflected Kennedy's confidence that his administration would chart a historically significant course in both domestic policy and foreign affairs. The contrast between this optimistic vision and the pressures of managing daily political realities at home and abroad would be one of the main tensions running through the early years of his administration. Kennedy brought to the White House a contrast in organization compared to the decision-making structure of former General Eisenhower, and he wasted no time in scrapping Eisenhower's methods. Kennedy preferred the organizational structure of a wheel with all the spokes leading to the president. He was ready and willing to make the increased number of quick decisions required in such an environment. He selected a mixture of experienced and inexperienced people to serve in his cabinet. We can learn our jobs together, he stated. Much to the chagrin of his economic advisors, who wanted him to reduce taxes, Kennedy quickly agreed to a balanced budget pledge. This was needed in exchange for votes to expand the membership of the House Rules Committee in order to give the Democrats a majority in setting the legislative agenda. Kennedy focused on immediate and specific issues facing the administration and quickly voiced his impatience with pondering deeper meanings. Deputy National Security Advisor Walt Whitman Rostow once began a diatribe about the growth of communism, and Kennedy abruptly cut him off, asking, what do you want me to do about that today? 
Kennedy approved Defense Secretary Robert McNamara's controversial decision to award the contract for the F-111 TFX fighter bomber to General Dynamics over Boeing. At the request of Senator Henry Jackson, Senator John McClellan held 46 days of mostly closed-door hearings before the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations investigating the TFX contract from February to November 1963. During the summer of 1962, Kennedy had a secret taping system set up in the White House, most likely to aid his future memoir. It recorded many conversations with Kennedy and his cabinet members, including those in relation to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Foreign Policy Kennedy's foreign policy was dominated by American confrontations with the Soviet Union, manifested by proxy contests in the early stage of the Cold War. In 1961 he anxiously anticipated a summit with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. He started off on the wrong foot by reacting aggressively to a routine Khrushchev speech on Cold War confrontation in early 1961. The speech was intended for domestic audiences in the Soviet Union, but Kennedy interpreted it as a personal challenge. His mistake helped raise tensions going into the Vienna summit of June 1961. On the way to the summit, Kennedy stopped in Paris to meet French President Charles de Gaulle who advised him to ignore Khrushchev's abrasive style. The French president feared the United States' presumed influence in Europe. Nevertheless, de Gaulle was quite impressed with the young president and his family. Kennedy picked up on this in his speech in Paris, saying that he would be remembered as the man who accompanied Jackie Kennedy to Paris. On June 4, 1961, Kennedy met with Khrushchev in Vienna and left the meetings angry and disappointed that he had allowed the premier to bully him, despite the warnings he had received. Khrushchev, for his part, was impressed with the president's intelligence but thought him weak. Kennedy did succeed in conveying the bottom line to Khrushchev on the most sensitive issue before them, a proposed treaty between Moscow and East Berlin. He made it clear that any treaty interfering with U.S. access rights in West Berlin would be regarded as an act of war. Shortly after Kennedy returned home, the USSR announced its plan to sign a treaty with East Berlin, abrogating any third-party occupation rights in either sector of the city. Depressed and angry, Kennedy assumed that his only option was to prepare the country for nuclear war which he personally thought had a 1 in 5 chance of occurring. In the weeks immediately following the Vienna summit, more than 20,000 people fled from East Berlin to the Western sector, reacting to statements from the USSR. Kennedy began intensive meetings on the Berlin issue, where Dean Ackeson took the lead in recommending a military buildup alongside NATO allies. In a July 1961 speech, Kennedy announced his decision to add $3.25 billion to the defense budget, along with over 200,000 additional troops, stating that an attack on West Berlin would be taken as an attack on the U.S. The speech received an 85% approval rating. A month later, both the Soviet Union and East Berlin began blocking any further passage of East Germans into West Berlin and erected barbed wire fences which were quickly upgraded to the Berlin Wall, around the city. Kennedy's initial reaction was to ignore this, as long as free access from the West to West Berlin continued. This course was altered when West Berliners had lost confidence in the defense of their position by the United States. Kennedy sent Vice President Johnson and Lucius D. Clay, along with a host of military personnel, in convoy through East Germany, including Soviet armed checkpoints, to demonstrate the continued commitment of the U.S. to West Berlin. Kennedy gave a speech at St. Anselm College on May 5, 1960, regarding America's conduct in the emerging Cold War. His address detailed how he felt American foreign policy should be conducted towards African nations, noting a hint of support for modern African nationalism by saying, For we, too, founded a new nation on revolt from colonial rule. Cuba and the Bay of Pigs Invasion Cuban Missile Crisis Latin America and Communism Peace Corps Southeast Asia 
American University Speech West Berlin Speech Israel Iraq Ireland Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Domestic Policy Kennedy called his domestic program the New Frontier. It ambitiously promised federal funding for education, medical care for the elderly, economic aid to rural regions, and government intervention to halt the recession. He also promised an end to racial discrimination, although his agenda, which included the endorsement of the Voter Education Project in 1962, produced little progress in areas such as Mississippi, where the AVEP concluded that discrimination was so entrenched. In his 1963 State of the Union address, he proposed substantial tax reform and a reduction in income tax rates from the current range of 20-90% to a range of 14-65% as well as a reduction in the corporate tax rates from 52-47%. to Kennedy added that the top rate should be set at 70% if certain deductions were not eliminated for high-income earners. Congress did not act until 1964, a year after his death when the top individual rate was lowered to 70%, and the top corporate rate was set at 48% to the Economic Club of New York, he spoke in 1963 of, the paradoxical truth that tax rates are too high and revenues too low, and the soundest way to raise revenue in the long term is to lower rates now. Congress passed few of Kennedy's major programs during his lifetime, but did vote them through in 1964 and 1965 under his successor Johnson. Economy Federal and Military Death Penalty Civil Rights Movement Civil Liberties Immigration Native American Relations Space Policy Administration, Cabinet and Judicial Appointments Judicial Appointments Supreme Court Other Courts Assassination President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Friday, November 22, 1963. He was in Texas on a political trip to smooth over frictions in the Democratic Party between liberals Ralph Yarborough and Don Yarborough and conservative John Connolly. Traveling in a presidential motorcade through downtown Dallas, he was shot once in the back, the bullet exiting via his throat, and once in the head. Kennedy was taken to Parkland Hospital for emergency medical treatment, where he was pronounced dead 30 minutes later, at 1 p.m. He was 46 years old and had been in office for 1,036 days. Lee Harvey Oswald an order filler at the Texas School Book Depository from which the shots were fired, was arrested for the murder of police officer J.D. Tippett and was subsequently charged with Kennedy's assassination. He denied shooting anyone, claiming he was a patsy, and was shot dead by Jack Ruby on November 24, before he could be prosecuted. Ruby was arrested and convicted for the murder of Oswald. Ruby successfully appealed his conviction and death sentence but became ill and died of cancer on January 3, 1967, while the date for his new trial was being set. President Johnson quickly issued an executive order to create the Warren Commission chaired by Chief Justice Earl Warren to investigate the assassination. The commission concluded that Oswald acted alone in killing Kennedy and that Oswald was not part of any conspiracy. The results of this investigation are disputed by many. The assassination proved to be a pivotal moment in U.S. history because of its impact on the nation, and the ensuing political repercussions. A 2004 Fox News poll found that 66% of Americans thought there had been a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy, while 74% thought that there had been a cover-up. A Gallup poll in November 2013 showed 61% believed in a conspiracy, and only 30% thought that Oswald did it alone. In 1979, the U.S. House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded, with one-third of the committee dissenting, that it believed that Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy. 
the committee was unable to identify the other gunmen or the extent of the conspiracy. This conclusion was based largely on audio recordings of the shooting. Subsequently, investigative reports from the FBI's Technical Services Division and a specially appointed National Academy of Sciences Committee determined that reliable acoustic data do not support a conclusion that there was a second gunman. The Justice Department concluded that no persuasive evidence can be identified to support the theory of a conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination. Funeral Kennedy's body was brought back to Washington after his assassination. Early on November 23, six military pallbearers carried the flag-draped coffin into the East Room of the White House, where he lay in repose for 24 hours. Then, the coffin was carried on a horse-drawn caisson to the Capitol to lie in state. Throughout the day and night, hundreds of thousands lined up to view the guarded casket, with a quarter million passing through the rotunda during the 18 hours of lying in state. Kennedy's funeral service was held on November 25, at St. Matthew's Cathedral. The Requiem Mass was led by Cardinal Richard Cushing. About 1,200 guests, including representatives from over 90 countries, attended. After the service, Kennedy was buried at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. Personal Life, Family, and Reputation The Kennedy family is one of the most established political families in the United States, having produced a president, three senators, three ambassadors, and multiple other representatives and politicians, both at the federal and state level. While a congressman, Kennedy embarked on a seven-week trip to India, Japan, Vietnam, and Israel in 1951 at which point he became close with his then 25-year-old brother Bobby, as well as his 27-year-old sister Pat. Because they were several years apart in age, the brothers had previously seen little of each other. This 25,000-mile trip was the first extended time they had spent together and resulted in their becoming best friends. Bobby would eventually play a major role in his brother's career serving as his brother's attorney general and presidential advisor. Bobby would later run for president in 1968 before his assassination, while another Kennedy brother, Ted, ran for president in 1980. Kennedy came in third in Gallup's list of widely admired people of the 20th century. Kennedy was a life member of the National Rifle Association. Wife and Children Kennedy met his future wife, Jacqueline Lee Jackie Bouvier, when he was a congressman. Charles L. Bartlett, a journalist, introduced the pair at a dinner party. They were married a year after he was elected senator, on September 12, 1953. After suffering a miscarriage in 1955 and a stillbirth in 1956, their daughter Caroline was born in 1957 and is the only surviving member of JFK's immediate family. John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr., nicknamed John John by the press as a child, was born in late November 1960, 17 days after his father was elected. John Jr., a graduate of Brown University, died in 1999 when the small plane he was piloting crashed en route to Martha's Vineyard. In 1963, months before JFK's assassination, Jackie gave birth to a son, Patrick. However, he died after two days due to complications from birth. Popular Image Kennedy and his wife were younger in comparison to the presidents and first ladies who preceded them, and both were popular in the media culture in ways more common to pop singers and movie stars than politicians influencing fashion trends and becoming the subjects of numerous photo spreads in popular magazines. Although Eisenhower had allowed presidential press conferences to be filmed for television, Kennedy was the first president to ask for them to be broadcast live and made good use of the medium. In 1961 the Radio Television News Directors Association presented Kennedy with its highest honor, the Paul White Award in recognition of his open relationship with the media.MRS. 
Kennedy brought new art and furniture to the White House and directed its restoration. They invited a range of artists, writers, and intellectuals to rounds of White House dinners, raising the profile of the arts in America. On the White House lawn, the Kennedys established a swimming pool and treehouse, while Caroline attended a preschool along with ten other children inside the home. Kennedy was closely tied to popular culture, emphasized by songs such as Twisting at the White House. Von Meter's first family comedy album, which parroted the president, the first lady, their family, and the administration, sold about four million copies. In an interview a week after JFK's death, Jacqueline Kennedy mentioned his affection for the Broadway musical Camelot and quoted its closing lines, Don't let it be forgot, that once there was a spot, for one brief, shining moment that was known as Camelot. The term Camelot has come to be used as shorthand for the Kennedy administration and the charisma of the Kennedy family. Health Despite a privileged youth, Kennedy was plagued by a series of childhood diseases, including whooping cough, chicken pox, measles, and ear infections. These ailments compelled him to spend a considerable amount of time in bed convalescing. Three months prior to his third birthday, in 1920, Kennedy came down with scarlet fever, a highly contagious and life-threatening disease, and was admitted to Boston City Hospital. Years after Kennedy's death, it was revealed that in September 1947, while Kennedy was 30 and in his first term in Congress, he was diagnosed by Sir Daniel Davis at the London Clinic with Addison's disease, a rare endocrine disorder. Davis estimated that Kennedy would not live for another year, while Kennedy himself hoped he could live for an additional 10. In 1966, White House physician Dr. Janet Travel revealed that Kennedy also had hypothyroidism. The presence of two endocrine diseases raises the possibility that Kennedy had autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome type 2. Kennedy also suffered from chronic and severe back pain, for which he had surgery. Kennedy's condition may have had diplomatic repercussions, as he appears to have been taking a combination of drugs to treat severe back pain during the 1961 Vienna summit with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. The combination included hormones, animal organ cells, steroids, vitamins, enzymes, and amphetamines, and possible potential side effects included hyperactivity, hypertension, impaired judgment, nervousness, and mood swings. Kennedy at one time was regularly seen by three doctors, one of whom, Max Jacobson, was unknown to the other two, as his mode of treatment was controversial and used for the most severe bouts of back pain. Into late 1961, disagreements existed among Kennedy's doctors concerning his proper balance of medication and exercise. Kennedy preferred the former because he was short on time and desired immediate relief. During that time, the president's physician, George Berkeley, did set up some gym equipment in the White House basement, where Kennedy did stretching exercises for his back three times a week. Details of these and other medical problems were not publicly disclosed during Kennedy's lifetime. The president's primary White House physician, George Berkeley, realized that treatments by Jacobson and Travel, including the excessive use of steroids and amphetamines, were medically inappropriate, and took action to remove Kennedy from their care. In 2002, Robert Dalek wrote an extensive history of Kennedy's health. Dalek was able to consult a collection of Kennedy associated papers from the years 1955 1963, including X rays and prescription records from the files of Dr. Travel. According to Travel's records, during his presidential years, Kennedy suffered from high fevers stomach, colon, and prostate issues, abscesses, high cholesterol, and adrenal problems. Travel kept a medicine administration record, cataloging Kennedy's medications, injected and ingested corticosteroids for his adrenal insufficiency, procaine shots and ultrasound treatments and hot packs for his back, lomotol, metamucil, paragoric, phenobarbital, testosterone, and tracentine to control his diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, 
and weight loss, penicillin and other antibiotics for his urinary tract infections and an abscess, and tuinal to help him sleep. Family Incidents Kennedy's older brother Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. was killed in action in 1944 at age 29 when his plane exploded over the English Channel during a first attack execution of Operation Aphrodite during World War II. His sister Rosemary Rosemary Kennedy was born in 1918 with intellectual disabilities and underwent a prefrontal lobotomy at age 23, leaving her incapacitated until her death in 2005. Another sister Kathleen Agnes Kick Kennedy died in a plane crash en route to France in 1948. His wife Jacqueline Kennedy suffered a miscarriage in 1955 and a stillbirth in 1956, a daughter informally named Arabella. A son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, died two days after birth in August 1963. Affairs and Friendships Kennedy was single in the 1940s while having relationships with Danish journalist Inga Arvad and actress Jean Tierney. During his time as a senator, he had an affair with Gunilla von Post, who later wrote that the future president tried to end his marriage to be with her before having any children with his wife. Kennedy was also reported to have had affairs with women such as Marilyn Monroe, Judith Campbell, Mary Pinchot Meyer, Marlena Dietrich, Mimi Alford, and his wife's press secretary, Pamela Tuna. The full extent of Kennedy's relationship with Monroe is not known, although it has been reported that they spent a weekend together in March 1962 while he was staying at Bing Crosby's house. Furthermore, people at the White House switchboard noted that Monroe had called Kennedy during 1962. J. Edgar Hoover the FBI director, received reports about Kennedy's indiscretions. These included an alleged East German spy Ellen Rometsch. According to historian Michael Beschloss, in July 1963, Hoover reportedly informed Bobby Kennedy about the affair. Hoover told the Attorney General that he not only had information that the President, but also others in Washington, had been involved with a woman suspected as a Soviet intelligence agent, someone linked to East German intelligence. Bobby Kennedy reportedly took the matter sufficiently seriously to raise it with leading Democratic and Republican figures in Congress. Former Secret Service agent Larry Newman also remembered morale problems that the president's indiscretions engendered within the Secret Service. Kennedy inspired affection and loyalty from the members of his team and his supporters. According to Reeves, this included the logistics of Kennedy's liaisons, required secrecy and devotion rare in the annals of the energetic service demanded by successful politicians. Kennedy believed that his friendly relationship with members of the press would help protect him from public revelations about his sex life. Lem Billings was Kennedy's oldest and best friend from the time they attended Cho together until Kennedy's death. Historical Evaluations and Legacy Presidency The U.S. Special Forces had a special bond with Kennedy. It was President Kennedy who was responsible for the rebuilding of the Special Forces and giving us back our Green Beret, said Forrest Lindley, a writer for the U.S. military newspaper Stars and Stripes who served with Special Forces in Vietnam. This bond was shown at Kennedy's funeral. At the commemoration of the 25th anniversary of Kennedy's death, General Michael D. Healy, the last commander of special forces in Vietnam, spoke at Arlington National Cemetery. Later, a wreath in the form of the Green Beret would be placed on the grave, continuing a tradition that began the day of his funeral when a sergeant in charge of a detail of special forces men guarding the grave placed his beret on the coffin. Kennedy was the first of six presidents to have served in the U.S. Navy, and one of the enduring legacies of his administration was the creation in 1961 of another Special Forces Command, the Navy SEALs, which Kennedy enthusiastically supported. Kennedy's civil rights proposals led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. President Lyndon B. Johnson, Kennedy's successor, took up the mantle and pushed the landmark Civil Rights Act through a bitterly divided Congress by invoking the slain president's memory. President Johnson then signed the act into law on July 2, 
1964. This civil rights law ended what was known as the Solid South and certain provisions were modeled after the Civil Rights Act of 1875, signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant. Kennedy's continuation of Presidents Harry S. Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower's policies of giving economic and military aid to South Vietnam left the door open for President Johnson's escalation of the conflict. At the time of Kennedy's death, no final policy decision had been made as to Vietnam, leading historians, cabinet members, and writers to continue to disagree on whether the Vietnam conflict would have escalated to the point it did had he survived. His agreement to the NSAM 263 action of withdrawing 1,000 troops by the end of 1963, and his earlier 1963 speech at American University, suggest that he was ready to end the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War contributed greatly to a decade of national difficulties, amid violent disappointment on the political landscape. Many of Kennedy's speeches are considered iconic, and despite his relatively short term in office, and the lack of major legislative changes coming to fruition during his term, he is considered by many Americans to be in the upper echelon of presidents. Some excerpts of Kennedy's inaugural address are engraved on a plaque at his grave at Arlington. In 2018 the Times published an audio recreation of the Watchman on the Walls of World Freedom speech he was scheduled to deliver at the Dallas Trade Mart on November 22, 1963. In 1961, he was awarded the Laetitaire Medal by the University of Notre Dame, considered the most prestigious award for American Catholics. He was posthumously awarded the PACM in Terrace Award. It was named after a 1963 encyclical letter by Pope John XXIII that calls upon all people of goodwill to secure peace among all nations. Kennedy also posthumously received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1963. Memorials and Eponyms A small sample of the extensive list at the main article includes Idlewild Airport in Queens, New York City, nation's busiest international gateway, renamed John F. Kennedy International Airport on December 24, 1963. NASA Launch Operations Center in Merritt Island, Florida named the John F. Kennedy Space Center on November 29, 1963. USS John F. Kennedy U.S. Navy aircraft carrier ordered in April 1964, launched May 1967, decommissioned August 2007, nicknamed Big John. Kennedy Half Dollar, first minted in 1964. John F. Kennedy School of Government, part of Harvard University, renamed in 1966. John F. Kennedy Federal Building in the Government Center section of Boston, Opened in 1966. John Fitzgerald Kennedy Memorial, opened in 1970 in Dallas. National Cultural Center was named John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in 1964, opened in 1971 in Washington, D.C. John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum on Columbia Point in Boston, opened in 1979. Statue of John F. Kennedy by Isabel McIlvain on the grounds of the Massachusetts State House in Boston, dedicated on May 29, 1990. USS John F. Kennedy, U.S. Navy aircraft carrier that began construction in 2011, and was scheduled to be placed in commission in 2020. Works Audio Books Han, Lorna John F. Kennedy North Africa, Nationalism to Nationhood Public Affairs Press LCCN 60011401 Kennedy, John F. Why England Slept W. Funk Kennedy, John F. Profiles in Courage Harper Kennedy, John F. A Nation of Immigrants Anti-Defamation League ISBN 978-0-06-144754-9 Video 
newsreel footage of the inauguration ceremony and speeches. See also General Notes References Citations Works cited Further reading Primary sources None Historiography and memory None